climb aboard. This is the Miles to Go podcast. And now here's your host, Ed Pizza. Hey guys, welcome back to the Miles to Go podcast. We are in transition phase, which means that we don't have Richard this week because he is out sick and I am testing out the new office. So while lots of stuff behind me is empty, we actually have airplanes instead of stacks of boxes covered with dust. We also have two of my favorite podcast guests to join us today. First, it's been a while since Clint has co-hosted the show with us. So we have Clint Henderson from TPG. Clint, it is great to have you back, even though this is a, a nasty topic to talk about today. But good to have you back on the show, man. Thanks for having me. And Gary joins us after giving me some generous ribbing after the Capital One opening about not being on for a while. I now get to have you on twice within the span of a month. So it'll be at least 90 days before you can complain that you haven't been on the show. Yeah, you're, you showed you were going to show me good, right? There you go. <laughs> I'm working on it. It took Richard to get sick again to have you come on again. Richard is home with the vid, unfortunately, but we have two guests who I think can really help break down a topic that if you've been living under a rock, maybe you haven't heard, but Delta made some massive changes and we were expecting these. I'm going to go over the changes from a high level standpoint, and then we're going to dig in with Gary and Clint on what this means for you. If you're just tuning into the show, you can shoot us an email. Ed at pizzaemotion.com is the best place to do that. You can text or leave us a voicemail at 571-293-6659. That number is in the show notes. And you can find me, social media, at Pizza in Motion. I'll actually get it right this week and tell you you can find Gary at, at Gary Leff. Clint, I actually quoted his old Flyer Talk handle when we recorded a few weeks ago. I heard that. And then, that's right, you are a listener of the show. And then Clint Page One on Instagram for Clint is where you can find all of us when we're not on the show here. So... So Delta changes, boy, man, I, you know, I, I expected them. Well, I don't want to editorialize yet. I expect them to be bad, but so first and foremost, from a high level standpoint, if you're trying to qualify for status, Delta does simplify things, which wasn't unexpected. Uh, you know, some of the other airlines have moved this way where money is the primary focus. Uh, what we've seen though, is that the, the amount of money that you'll need to spend with Delta to achieve a certain status level will go up significantly. In some cases, as much as 75 to 100% more dollars or medallion qualifying dollars than, than used to. There are some ways to spend your way to status, though spend waivers are gone. And the earnings for credit cards are, I would say, you know, lackluster in the, in the new format. For the best earning card, the Delta Reserve card, you'll earn one one medallion qualifying dollar for every $10 you spend on the card. As well, the Sky Club access is changing pretty drastically. There, this affects both folks who hold Delta co-branded cards and non-co-branded cards. Bottom line here is that unless you're willing to spend a lot of money on the card, 75000 you won't have unlimited access to the Delta Sky Club starting in 2025. So with all of that said, I guess I'll go to Gary first. From, a, from an overall perspective, is this better, worse, or about what you expected from Delta, knowing that they were going to have to make some changes? Well, if we want to call it better than expected, I'll say that they only substantially changed elite qualifying and Sky Club access, right? <laughs> so other things aren't worse than before. And we did not know that that was going to be the case. So in some sense, you know, maybe partially better. I think that the Sky Club changes were about what we expected, both in terms of limiting access for their reserve credit card holders, not allowing day pass purchase by their platinum co-brand partners and excluding customers on basic economy fares for their credit card holders, which they had already done for their paid members. Now, to me, that's pretty bad because, you know, look, they even redeem their lowest price awards into basic economy, which makes Delta pretty uniquely punitive on that redemption side. So you finally like spend enough on the card and with the airline to earn the points to redeem them. And you've got their premium card and you're doing what they want, right? And, and you're trying to save those points and they turn you away from the club, even though you have, you know, your like some of your 10 chits in left because of the fare that you redeemed your points for. So it does feel like they've gone a little bit too far there. And it feels like they've gone pretty darn far on the elite qualifying side. And, you know, like Clint will be able to talk about what that's like as a Delta elite. It just seems like uh, they have gone to the straight qualifying dollar idea of United. They've gone to the idea of having things other than flying count more broadly, 
like American, but not as much and not as generously in both cases. So they're asking a lot more from customers, right? For at most the same thing they were getting before. Usually there's a sweetener there of some kind. Look, you know, you're going to do more. You're going to you know, really stretch to stick with us in the program. And we're clearly giving you a better value proposition at a certain number. Like they ha they're not even saying that, right? Like, no, you're going to give us more, right? Or else uh, is, is kind of the idea here. Yeah, they, that, there definitely is a little bit more of a give us more or else sort of feeling. Clint, uh, you know, from a high level standpoint, same question for you. Is this better or worse than what you were expecting to come out? Much worse. Much worse. I remember being shocked when American Airlines' highest tier status was going to require an exorbitant amount of spend. I thought, in my opinion, now this is just insane. $35,000. Who, what flyers are spending $35,000 on Delta that don't already get upgrades, that don't already get everything they want because of the cabin they're flying in. They're buying last minute first class tickets. Delta is basically given a big middle finger to anyone who's not a either a super wealthy consumer who's already giving them a ton of money or a small business owner who can put a ton of spend on a credit card like the Delta Reserve that doesn't make a lot of sense as far as a points earning card goes. And the amount that you would have to put on that Delta Reserve card, $350,000 in spend. I mean, it's just, it's ludicrous to me. I mean, I, I, I cannot express to you how frustrating it is. This is the first year I was very excited to get, finally get Delta Diamond status. I was like, okay, I'm going to see what all the fuss is about, but I'm going to give up entirely on Delta next year. I mean, I'll enjoy the Delta Diamond status, but I'm not going to put any more spend on these cards. I just don't think it makes sense for most consumers. Maybe there's a few people out there who can really maximize this, but for most of us mere mortals, I don't, I, I just don't think it's, it's a good program anymore at all. Well, and you touched on a, on a good point and, you know, this came up in, in our Slack community and it's something that we've discussed. And it, just as an aside, if you are looking for a way to support the show, our Slack community is a great way to do that. There's a link in the show notes. You can join us to have these sort of discussions on a weekly basis. We also do uh, weekly happy hours as well. You know, you touched on the number of upgrades and I think it's interesting to think of I'll use myself as an example. We're about three quarters of the way through the year and I've spent about $25,000 with United. So you know, I'll probably finish the year in that $30,000 range. Maybe I get to 35, but, I'm, but that would be really stretching it. And that's with a couple of pricier you know, international trips this year than I would normally have. And so it does occur to me that most of the people that can afford to spend $35,000 on airfare with the airline are probably already sitting up front probably one of the most valuable benefits. Everybody's got their own fit and feel here, but you know, Gary, one of the most valuable benefits for those folks is likely not very beneficial for them because they're already sitting up front for most of their flights. I mean, a lot of Delta Diamonds are already spending $30,000 plus with the airline. It's a bit of an odd time though to be doubling down on the, you know, the corporate other people's money traveler, right? when they report that managed travel is flat and not really coming back uh, to pre-COVID levels. You know, the folks are, are, are already buying up front. Delta it says themselves, they're doing an incredible job of selling those seats up front. They report that you know, in August, it was over 75% of their first class seats were sold, right? And that is really understating it in many ways because there's a lot of routes that aren't the places that people you know go and buy premium tickets right. where those forward cabins are kind of empty right mm -hmm. well, what they don't disclose is you know what does atlanta san francisco look like atlanta la right. atlanta new york or even you know atlanta south florida where they're they're selling these seats to an extreme degree you know, it, it was certainly the case that 15 years ago nine out of ten of those seats were available for upgrades Yep. Now, maybe two, right? So, and, and what they've also talked about is that the future, they're not done making changes, right? They are, you know, 100% clear that there are more changes to come, not this year, probably not next year, but in the coming years to the program. So even if, even if you can convince yourself, like this works for you, this is only still a way station on the direction that they're going. And they plan to further segment that first class cabin. They describe the way they've done with economy, with you know, basic economy, comfort plus. They're trying to extract more revenue from that cabin so we can expect that upgrades become even scarcer. So you say, oh, well, look, I'm already spending you know, $35,000 with Delta. Maybe I'm better off thinning the herd. Well, maybe not because 
the upgrade seeds that are available for those times that you are not buying the seeds, right, are going to become scarcer, even as perhaps the number of diamonds become scarcer. So it's not even obviously better. Now, if you're never buying a basic economy ticket and you are spending 75000 or more on your reserve card or buying the paid membership into the lounge, maybe it'll be a little bit less crowded. And so that's kind of a benefit for you. But yeah, most of the people who are buying, who are spending at that level aren't super worried about upgrades, which is good because they're not too frequent. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you know, I think the lounge access is an interesting discussion. Real quick before we get there, you know, as, as folks know, we've taken the show to video over the past few months. And as part of that shift, we've also shifted into, into finding partners that can help us produce this higher quality show. This week, we're sponsored by NordVPN. You know, I've always been a fan of using a VPN when I'm traveling, usually from a safety and a security standpoint. I used to travel to China on a regular basis, and it was necessary to even have a reliable connection, um, let alone the safety and security aspect. NordVPN has been a leader in this space for quite a while, and they've recently opened my eyes to other uses for VPN. Uh, NordVPN has the ability to put you somewhere in the world geographically, and for folks who use the various streaming services, that could be vital to accessing your content. For me, I wouldn't have been able to keep up with uh, the Tour de France this summer uh, outside of the U.S. without the help of NordVPN. They're currently offering listeners of our show a 50% discount on annual packages when you sign up for their mobile plan which is already pretty affordable. It's worth the peace of mind to have the protection and NordVPN might just help you keep up on your favorite TV show when you're on the road. So let's talk a little bit about Sky Club. And you know, I started to think about this, Clint, from the standpoint of how many times I visit a club on an annual basis. And I think it's fair to say, you know, first and foremost, that you know, Delta raised the price of Sky Club access. I believe it's $6.95 for an individual membership now. That Delta Reserve card is a five hundred and fifty dollars annual fee. So, so credit card holders aren't paying the full boat for a Sky Club access, but they're paying a significant amount of money. And when I think about a typical trip for me, and to be clear, I'm not one hundred percent sure how Delta is going to interpret these things. But when I look at a typical trip for me, I could visit the lounge as much as three times on a one way flight. Typically, if it's a connecting voyage, I'm probably going to visit twice. I might stop on my way in if I get to the airport early and I'm in a spot that has a Delta Sky Club, say like a New Orleans where there's a nice new club there. And then if I'm connecting, I'm almost certainly going to swing by the club to sit and do some work, catch up on email, stuff like that. So if I am restricted to 10 visits, I mean, my first question to Delta is going to be, does that count for two of my 10? Uh, but then also as I extrapolate this out, how quickly would a road warrior go through 10 visits? And it, it feels like, you know, if you're a Diamond member and you travel on, on Delta regularly, you're a little bit better situation than me because you live essentially in a Delta hub with New York where I don't. So maybe you have a few less connecting flights, but I have to imagine 10 visits is going to, you're going to blow through those pretty quickly. No, that's so I'm, if I'm going home to Montana to see my dad, that's the club in JFK and the club in Salt Lake city. Right. So there's right. two right there. Right. Another two on the way back. That's basically half of my visits for the year. If, if my friend is a road warrior and he said to me, you know, he has to travel every week. Well, those passes are gone in a month, basically. So, and that's for their top tier card. Like, what's the incentive to keep that Delta Reserve card? I just don't see it, especially with the spend requirement so much. The other thing I would just say for corporate travelers is some of them cannot put their travel on a, on a Delta card. They have to right. use a corporate card. So what happens to those folks? I mean, are they just, uh, you know, SOL? I, I just... It just seems very short-sighted. I think it's really interesting. I have never, and Gary, you'll, you can speak to this better than I can, but I have never seen the reaction in the blogosphere, in the Facebook groups, in the loyalty community, uh, the outrage that I've seen with this one. And I know there's petitions circulating already to try to get them to uh, sort of snap back on some of these decisions, but it's, it's, it's kind of shocking to me to see what they've done to the majority of their, of their loyal customers. I mean, Clint, you're right. I mean, if you look at this $550 annual fee card that now only get, they used to give you unlimited access and it could, you know, maybe it was 100, 200 visits in a year, you get 10. You're pre-purchasing Sky Club passes, right, in a booklet of 10 at an average cost of $55 a visit. Now you're, you're not even amortizing it over enough visits to make it feel worthwhile because a lot of folks 
aren't going to spend you know, $55 a time, that the value per visit is pretty low unless you're also committing to that $75,000 uh, spend level. And then if you are doing that, like leave aside that like that's not even in the realm of possibility for most people, right? The median person, sure, uh, the airline passengers skew, you know, certainly wealthier than the country as a whole. And, you know, they may spend more on their credit card than they even realize. But if you focus your spending on a card, then maybe you're just without really you know, figuring out ways of maximizing using employer spend or whatever, maybe you get to 25 or $30,000 of credit card spend in a year and not 75. But if you do, if you do that, and then you've earned Delta miles like with your, with your right. spending. And, and so you, know, you also have to think about, well, gee, I value the currency that I'm accumulating when there are other much more valuable currencies that I could be you know, spent, you know, earning to take my family on a trip. It, it, it's a very difficult hurdle. It is a you know, very costly hurdle. And there is an incredible amount of anger among people who feel that they have been loyal customers of the airline and who are now being told that they do not matter and will not be treated as well. In some sense, look, it's fair for Delta to say what behavior they value, right? Or put a different way. It's not even that they want to value the right people. They want to incentivize the right behavior. They're, they're very clear that they believe this is going to be, in their words, accretive, right? So the Delta Amex partnership, they say this year, they're expecting to generate just shy of $7 billion in revenue. They're currently moving what they say a little bit shy of 1% of country's GDP on their co-grand product. And they think, they believe that their customers will stick with them and stretch to do more so they can push people to you know, really focus and generate more for them and some more, more revenue. Like they're not idiot. I, I kind of think they may be pushing too far given this reaction. And the funny thing is that the biggest reaction I've ever seen before was also with Delta 20 years ago. The, when Delta 20 years ago decided that only full fare tickets would count towards status, as well as some other restrictions. And the, after two years of customer backlash, they organized customers who organized themselves in the Save Sky Miles campaign. Right? It was <laughs> Delta stands for driving every loyal traveler away. They literally took out People contributed their own cash to take out ads in, among other places, like the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and to design billboard on a truck that drove around the Delta shareholders meeting, right, with this you know, driving every, every dollar traveler away you know, message, saveskymiles.com. Two years later, they did relent, like completely reversed those changes. But the thing is, back then, right, you had airlines were in a much trickier spot after 9-11 recession, going into the Great Recession. So there were lots of instances of airlines uh, backtracking on changes that they had made. And really, and then, then during, in the immediate aftermath of the Great Recession, they weren't making these really bad changes. But in the last decade, other than Delta scaling back its change to Sky Club, where they were, you know, in, in terms of the, their visit limitations, you know, at, after a flight, Right. right. They, they, they scaled back some of the Sky Club changes that they made. But other than that, responding to consumers is just something that we haven't seen from airlines as much. They're in a much stronger position relative to those consumers. And Delta thinks that they can, like, you know, tweak the customer and get them to, like, do what they want. And, um, and they've I'm, historically I'm sure. been right. I mean, we've accepted that you take 600,000 miles now to fly business class round trip to Europe or to <laughs> Sydney. Like, and, and customers bought that. But I'm not interested in buying that anymore. I, I've had my brother and my father spending all their personal spend on the Delta Reserve card so that I could get the MQD waiver every year. Well, right. I'm closing those cards, I'm not having them waste their spend on, on a card that only gives me a point per dollar spend. You know, like, it just doesn't make any financial sense for me anymore. Well, you bring up a good point, Clint, and you have the Reserve card, right? Yeah. So my question is, so you're going to close that card. And and to be fair, if if you're going to max out the lounge access quickly, the card itself is not terribly more beneficial than other Delta cards when it comes to offering benefits. So three three point three miles per dollar on Delta Sky Mile, uh, Delta purchases, one mile per dollar and everything else. So clearly we know there are more valuable cards out there in the marketplace to earn on uh, other bonus categories, dining, 
groceries, gas, all that stuff. On top of that, other Delta credit cards offer you the 15% discount on award travel. So you don't need to have the reserve card to, you know, to, to get that 15% discount. So, so I guess I know it's early on, but do you think that you'll move to a lesser Delta credit card or do you think you're out of the Delta credit card business entirely? I think what I'll do is see if I can downgrade to a no annual fee version, which they may not let me do. Right. Then open a basic gold Delta Sky Miles card because that gets me free bags at least. And then I, I potentially, if I don't close that as well, but the American Express Platinum card would still get me six entries for those times I'm stuck in an airport for eight hours and I want to go to a Delta lounge. But those instances are few and far between. It just, I, I don't think the lounges are worth $55 a visit, frankly, to your point, Gary. And, and now that I've experienced the glories of all the lounges in their various forms, I could probably go back to living without them. <laughs> Well, and I think to Gary's point in terms of the value of a lounge visit, I think, you know, using my situation, I have two Delta Reserve cards, one for personal and one for business. I actually use both of them for two different businesses. And the, a big part of the reason why I got them was during the pandemic, you know, Delta was counting all spend towards lifetime status in a very, in a very meaningful way, not all spend, sorry. Uh, they're counting spend in a very meaningful way by giving bonus MQDs for spending. And so I wanted to max that out and, and work my way towards diamond status and try it. And then ultimately, it was actually sort of a, backward, a backdoor path to some level of lifetime status with Delta. All of that goes away with the new cards. There are no spend waivers. You know, I can't, can't really earn towards lifetime status anymore. So it really does come down to, could I spend enough on the cards to earn you know, diamond status? And... Am I going to need lounge access more than 20 times, you know, 10 per card per year? I, I don't think I'd need more than 20 because I normally use them just for connecting itineraries. So I'd probably be fine with both, but I'm not going to put anywhere near that much spend on a Delta credit card. I, I did put a decent amount of spend to get the Diamond. And I thought at the time Diamond was better than what I was being offered as a United 1K and, and probably better than what I was receiving as an American Executive Platinum. But for $1,100 between the two of them in annual fees, I won't keep either one of them. And since I don't have check bag situations like you do on the airlines, I'm virtually always traveling for business. The you know handful of times I travel for pleasure, I, it would probably just be cheaper to pay for check bags when when we do have them. So, to to Gary, to your point of, you know, they expect to grow the pot of revenue. I still struggle with that because, and I understand that Clint and I aren't necessarily the representative customer, but collectively between the three of us, we're dropping from. Sixteen hundred ish dollars in annual fees to maybe a hundred, and spend is going to go way down when what we're going to spend on the cards. Yeah, let's not forget though. So it's easy to say, well, maybe I want to go apply for a gold card. They've thought of that. We've now seen no lifetime language on new bonuses across the family of cards, and so you can't just like we'll go sign up for this other one and you know, get the new bonus. They want to don't want to incentivize that. And the reserve card is what you need if you care about earning the status because it earns, because the platinum card even earns at only half the rate and the, yeah. the gold card doesn't earn, the no annual fee doesn't earn you know, in contrast to, to American, right? What Delta has had this experience that's different than other airlines. So other airlines, when they've devalued their miles, they've seen a reduction in spend in their co-brand portfolio and Delta has not, right? Delta has had the better brand. Right. They've had you know, hubs where they really have you know, hub captive customers. And so, you know, if you're in Atlanta, if you're in like the upper Midwest, you know, you're in this, you know, you're going to fly Delta. And if you're going to do that, you're you've you've stuck with them even when their points haven't gone as far. And if maybe they've learned this lesson too well, because there's sure. clearly a point at which consumers would defect. If you literally give customers zero. Right. They're not going to stick with their cards and their spent. So at some point less than, you know, before you get there, the customers bail. So far they haven't seen it. Maybe they're testing it and we're going to, you know, we're, we're, yeah, the question is like, are they able to generate more spend or are they firing too many customers in the process? And I think we don't know yet the answer to that, but clearly like what you're both thinking is like what everyone's working through. They think enough people are going to come out the opposite way. That they right. come out ahead. Like that's the theory, right? And it's not obvious that theory is true, except to say that they haven't been wrong yet. And everyone needs to do that 
calculation for themselves of saying, look, how much is this treadmill with Delta worth? Of how much do I, can I do what they're asking? And if I can't, you know, what is the best option for me? And, you know, if you're in Atlanta, there's a good chance you probably are still going to fly Delta anyway with sure. lesser status, maybe keep a card for like the check bags and some airport priority, right? But you probably shouldn't be spending on the product. Even if you wanted Delta miles, right? You go get yourself a membership rewards earning card that earns more points per dollar. You can transfer to Delta or somewhere else, right? And then you'll learn the glories of like other right. partners. Well, and I think to, to that point, I think, I think there are enough, well, I certainly think it's going to be hard to offset. So I'll take my own example and say, I put 250000 on the card last year to earn di the diamond waiver. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to do that at all in 2024. In fact, my, my card spend will likely go to zero. And so, you know, at a very micro, micro level, they have to find someone who's going to buy, you know, some, you know, thousand number dollar of air, worth of airfare. So, you know, if I move some flights back to United, you know, four or $5,000 in airfare and $250,000 in card spend to make up for me. And then and Clint, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, you know, in, in, as you look at this matrix of things, I know you said downgrade the card, stuff like that. Do you think the changes make you less likely to fly Delta? You know, and I think you've got two scenarios. First off, you've obviously got family in Montana, and I don't know if there are other, you know, carriers that serve that airport, small airport. And then, you know, you've got, options being in New York. You don't have to fly Delta. You've got access to multiple carriers. Yeah. As I'll tell you what happened. American Airlines sucked me right back in. So mm -hmm. I am now executive platinum through the status pass. And I'm going to shift all my spending to American Airlines because they reward me more than Delta rewards me. I can get to Bozeman on American or on Alaska Airlines. So they have a little partnership that I've been using. And I'm going to change all my, my brother and my father and they're going to switch to American Airlines credit cards. And that's where my spend is going, because at least I know I'm getting more for my buck on that spend than I am on Delta going forward. All right. Last question for both of you. I'll just say, Ed, Ed, this is actually really just on your point. Yeah. This is really interesting. You're already doing $250,000 spend. And to you, their ask is sufficiently absurd. Like, even though you clearly have the ability to say, yeah. here's $250,000 spend that I'm doing. Right. And some ticket purchases, I can still be diamond and have full access to the lounges. And you're saying you've got to be kidding me. Right. And so that I think is a really telling that it just, it doesn't feel like fair and it, on a, at a fundamental level that there's just a sense in which they've, they've, they've pushed too far. Well, yeah. And I think for me, part of it was I sort of pinched my nose on the $250,000 in spend because I knew not all of it was you know, dollar for dollar, the best place to put that spend. If I put that spend, say, on my Cap One Venture X card, I would I would get more distance out of those points than I would if they were Sky Miles. And so I knew I was, quote unquote, paying a price for putting that $250,000 on that card. And now I've increased that price. And maybe not the whole way, because to your point, I'd have some flights, but I would ha likely have to spend more, maybe another forty dollars or $50,000 on the card for less valuable currency. By the way, in a culture where I'm not sure they're going to keep the currency as valuable as it is today, because they've yeah. they've proven in the past, it was you know I was actually working on a story uh, uh, with Clint, and you know we got a quote from from Brett Snyder, Cranky Flyer, and 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 it was a great quote. It was very it was very vintage Brett, and it was anyone who put value in Sky Miles and expected that to remain, what have you been watching the past few years? I thought it was a, a very a very telling uh, telling way to frame it. So last question for, for both of you guys, and you know, this requires you guys to dust off the crystal ball. And since Gary got the first, got to go first, Clint, you get to dust off your crystal ball first. Knowing the landscape that's out there and understanding what American has done with loyalty points and that it's been a little bit of, of a hot minute since United did a complete revamp of their program. Do you see United and uh, American and or American being emboldened by the length of these changes to say, you know, maybe we should move our bar further as well. I think they're going to take a wait and see approach of both of them. I think it'll be at least uh, six months to a year before we see any similar moves from American or United, because I don't think Delta realizes the Pandora's box that they've just opened. I think we're only beginning to see the beginning of it. And I think, I think they went too far with this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm naive, but 
I, I personally predict there's going to be a major consumer loss for them. Gary, how about you? What do you where do you see things? Uh, so lounge first, you know, American just came out with their lounge cost and changes to their premium card uh, right. lounge access. As a result, I don't see that changing again anytime soon. And the fact that American isn't going to go down the road that Delta did anytime soon uh, suggests to me that United will probably be kind of more cautious about doing that in the near term. And so if, if nothing else, a timing issue makes it something we probably don't have to worry about for a while elsewhere, right? Uh, and then in terms of increasing the ask for status, look, I mean, American was very transparent uh, when they introduced loyalty points about what they expected to happen. They said there's going to be more lower tier status folks, maybe a fewer uh, at the you know, two fewer top tier. And they were trying something new. And so after a year, they both adjusted the number of loyalty points for you know, some of their status level. Gold went from 30,000 to 40,000. They also decoupled the number of loyalty points needed to reach some of the benefits that were uh, previously earned at the same level as status. So you know, you're at you know, 100, there's 175,000 loyalty point level instead of earning at 125 with Platinum Pro. There's a 250,000 loyalty point level instead of earning at Executive Platinum 200K. They're, they certainly could tweak, right, year over year, some of the points required for status. It doesn't seem like they're likely to go all in on that the way that Delta has. Because remember, it's also they've got a lot more partners earning loyalty points than Delta has. It's only, you know, credit card, hotel and car and vacations through the portal. And by the way, if you're booking your hotels, through Delta, you're not, you, know, you all of a sudden, because you, you care about Delta's points, but you don't care about hotel points, right? Or hotel status, because you're not going to earn credit for those or have those recognized, but they don't have the panoply of other opportunities for earning those points. And remember, American is selling those loyalty points to you know, many of their partners out of premiums. I don't think they're going to be keen on kind of killing that golden goose or risking it in the way that it's a huge gamble that Delta has taken. They might come out ahead. They may be yeah. right, but it is a huge gamble with what in their own telling nearly $7 billion in revenue that they could you know, really see, you know, deleterious effects in, right? Or they, it could mean that their customers stick with them and grow. And like, we just don't know. And as we see the results and other carriers see the results, they might try something similar as they've done in the past. It was always the case, like other airlines would copy Delta even though th then they would get different results than Delta because they have different business. So we'll, we'll see if they've learned their lesson. Yeah. And for my part, I would say that I feel like this is the beginning of the beginning, a phrase that we use in the, in the VC world on a, uh, during my day job. You know, I, I don't think that United or American are going to make any immediate changes. I definitely think that they'll be in a wait and see approach just like, just like Delta is. But if Delta does move the needle in a positive direction here, then United and American are forced to, to take a look at these sorts of actions. If on the other hand, there's a retreat and even a 10% decrease in that co-brand card revenue is $700 million, then it wouldn't surprise me to see some status match opportunities, maybe some generous language in terms of credit card signup offers from American and United to try and t t take some of those customers away. I think it's worth noting that in today's day and age, with less overall business travelers out there, Leisure travelers are probably different, you know, from a credit card spend standpoint than those business travelers are. So it's a very dynamic world that we live in right now. And setting aside my own personal feelings about how it changes my travel, I'm going to be insanely interested to see where things go over the next couple of years here. Clinton, Gary, I couldn't have asked for two better folks to join here. I, you know, I loved Clint's comment in pre-show. He said that when he saw the Delta changes, he was really looking forward to what we were going to say on the episode because he <laughs> listens every week. And instead, you got to form the thoughts right here. So when 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 Richard is uh, well enough to come back on and record with us again, I'm sure he's going to have opinions and you'll hear those. But I think yours were very well formed and I appreciate the, the time. And, and Gary, it's good to have you back on a second time in a month to talk about, for at least for me, what was one of the more monumental shifts in the, the points and miles world that we've seen in quite some time. Gentlemen, I wish you both well with the rest of your week. I'm off to Las Vegas to do some work this week. Uh, I'll be flying United, not Delta. And as normal, I'll be sitting in the back of the bus. I wish you both well in your travels. God and until we, until we meet again, and until we upload again, we've got miles to go.
much worse, much worse. 